Today I want to look at a video that I claimed that the Egyptians knew about the Pythagorean Theorem thousands of years before Pythagoras, and in fact, Pythagoras is, got his theorem from the Egyptians. I don't believe this one bit, but we will look at the evidence uh, piece by piece and see how it actually fits. I want to read first a quote from Stephen Hawking's book, God Created the Integer. It says, We may therefore admit that the Egyptians knew that 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared, but there seems to be no evidence that they knew the triangle 3, 4, 5 is right angled. Indeed, according to latest authority, T. Eric Pete, the Rhine mathematical papyrus, Nothing in Egyptian mathematics suggests that Egyptians were acquainted with this or any special case of the Pythagorean Theorem. So we know that the Egyptians knew 3 squared plus 4 squared uh, equals 5 squared. Um, 3, 4, 5 seems to be very special to the Egyptians, as we will see uh, later in the video. However, if you were just given the equation 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared, there is no real evidence in the equation itself that we're even talking about a triangle. The equation itself shows more or less that we're talking about areas instead of triangles, which makes more sense. Um, but let's see what the video has to say. The Pythagoras Theorem The African Origin of the Pythagorean Theorem Pythagoras was a Greek philosopher who is said to have lived around 500 BC, and is credited by most Western educational institutions with the development of what they call the Pythagorean Theorem, the mathematic equation which expresses the relationship between the sides of a right triangle, where the square of the hypotenuse of the triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides of the triangle. The Pythagorean Theorem is also known as the 47th problem of Euclid, because Euclid, who is said to have lived several hundred years after Pythagoras, and is called the father of geometry by Western educational institutions, worked on solving the ratio 3-4-5 Pythagorean triple. If I don't have anything major to say up to this point, and all of this sounds pretty decent, talks about uh, Pythagoras and talks a little bit about Euclid. Uh, Euclid, I was not familiar with it being called uh, Euclid's 47th problem. I was more familiar with it as prop, uh, proposition number 47, where he actually proves the Pythagorean theorem in a general form, as I understand it, and not necessarily the 3, 4, 5 triangle itself, which is a special case of the right triangle. Here he actually proves a squared plus b squared equals c squared, specifically using a right triangle as it equates to a right triangle. The first five numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, are squared to yield, 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25, then subtracting each square, from the next, yields the sequence 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. However, it has long been suspected that the Pythagorean Theorem, and the proof of the Pythagorean Theorem, existed thousands of years before Pythagoras is said to have been born. Evidence that the Babylonians had knowledge of Pythagorean triples is available on the artifact known as Plimpton 322, which contains tables inscribed with Pythagorean triples. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the Plimpton 322. This, if anything, shows that the Babylonians knew about the Pythagorean theorem before Pythagoras, rather than the Egyptians knowing about the Pythagorean theorem before Pythagoras. Plimpton 322 does have the triples, and I want to point out, this is not a proof of the Pythagorean Theorem. These are just numerics of showing that these people knew the relationship between the sides and the hypotenuse. And they calculated quite to an astonishing degree the proper calculations uh, on a range of angles. Once again, this is not a general form and this is not all the angles, but they must have had some methodology to calculate um, these numbers precisely. This is, this is quite impressive, however, not general, only a range of angles, not Egyptian, this is Babylonian. I don't know why they even brought this up in this video. In his collection of essays entitled Morali Volume 5, 
the Greek essayist Plutarch comments on the ancient Egyptians' knowledge of the 345 Pythagorean triple, and its relationship to the sides of a right triangle expressed in ancient Egyptian symbolism by saying, The upright, therefore, may be likened to the male, the base to the female, and the hypotenuse to the child of both, and so Asar may be regarded as the origin, Aset as the recipient, and Heru as perfected result. 3 is the first perfect odd number, 4 is a square whose side is the even number 2, but 5 is in some ways like its father, and in some ways like its mother, being made up of 3 and 2. Okay, this part is the part that really ticks me off more than anything in the whole, the rest of the video, because it's highly manipulative, highly misleading to the person who uh, might just read this straight out. Let's go to Moralia Volume 5. And actually, I actually found the quote here in the volume. And let's read the whole thing. It says, One might conjecture that the Egyptians hold in high honor the most beautiful of triangles, since they liken the nature of the universe most closely to it. As Plato in the Republic seems to have made use of it in formulating his figure of marriage. This triangle has its upright of three units, its base of four, and its hypotenuse of five, whose power is equal to that of the other two sides. The upright, therefore, may be likened unto the male, the base to the female, and the hypotenuse to the child of both. And so Osiris may be regarded as the origin, Isis as the recipient, and Horus as the perfected result. Three of the first perfect odd numbers, four is the square whose side is the even number, two, but five in some ways may weigh like to its father, and in some ways like to its mother, being made up of three and two. Okay, let's go over this quote. First of all, he's talking about the right triangle, of, of course. He's trying to mix Egyptian with Greek, as we can see here. He sees something very close. He sees the three, four, five, and he says, holy cow, this must be a right triangle. However, he's the one that creates the right triangle. And in the Egyptian, there is no proof of the right triangle. So he says, as Plato in the Republic, he starts talking about Plato. This triangle, um, talking about uh, Plato, it has the upright of three units, the base of four, and the hypotenuse of five, whose power is equal to the other side. And he starts to talk about how Plato uh, formulated the figure of marriage of this triangle. He says, the upright, therefore, may be likened to the male the base to the female, and the hypotenuse to both, the child of both. So this is Plato's version of marriage. This is not Egyptian. This is Plato's version of marriage. And then on this part, he starts to mix the two together and show how close Greek and Egyptian are. He says, Osiris may be regarded as the origin, Isis as the recipient and Horus as the perfected result. You know, since they're a family, let's put them in the triangle. And that's what they did. And this is the last part talking about the Egyptian part. It says, three is the perfect odd number. Four is the square whose side is the even number. Two, but five in some ways like to his father and in some way like to his mother. Being made up of three and two. Two. The interesting part here is that the last part they say it's being made up of three and two because that's what how you get five. Three plus two equals five. However, if you're talking about a triangle, three and four equals five. So it's clear here that they're not talking about a triangle. This last part, they're not talking about a triangle, but they're talking just about numerology and three and two make up five, not three and four make up five. It's highly misleading, and I encourage anybody who wants to learn more to go go read this. This is the, actually the whole quote, and I just want to point out, this is just a conjecture on Plutarch, Plutarch's part, because he, he doesn't have full evidence that this is what the Egyptians were talking about. This is, he just kind of made this up saying, oh, look how close this is. Because, you know, if someone just comes up and says three, four, five, you know, to us, that's a, that's a, that's a right triangle. However, to other people, it might be something else. And so he, when he tries to mash it together, it doesn't actually work out. And this is a highly misleading quote. And this is one that really made me mad, um, out of the whole thing. In the book Stolen Legacy by George G. M. James, 
it is argued that Pythagoras was shown proof of the theorem by the ancient Egyptians. It states, Pythagoras traveled to Egypt and was taught geometry by the Egyptian priests, and made to sacrifice to the gods, before they showed him the proof of the theorem of the square of the hypotenuse of a right-angled triangle. Pythagoras did not discover this proof, and it is misleading to name the theorem after him. The book Stolen Legacy also states, We have the statements of Plutarch, Demetrius, and Antisthenes, that Pythagoras founded the science of mathematics among the Greeks, and that he sacrificed to the Muses, when the Egyptian priests explained to him the properties of the right-angled triangle. Pythagoras was also trained in music by the Egyptian priests. Okay, so Pythagoras may have traveled around, he may have gone to Egypt, he may have even learned from the Egyptians. Uh, and this is not a point that is very controversial. Um, however, I want to point out that he also traveled to, he also may have traveled to India. This is part of a discussion that has been recently um, brought up again because it may that may be that the Greeks are indebted to uh, this geometry because of the Indians. This is where the Pythagore Pythagoras may have gotten it. It is more likely that um, the Indians, um, because it has been documented that they knew about these relationships and could prove it. So it is more likely it comes from India than Egypt. And we talked a little bit about Plutarch, but I don't know who these other two guys are, and I don't know um, where it says that this is where Pythagoras learned it, because we show no evidence of the Egyptians even knowing about the secrets of the right triangle. The proof attributed to Pythagoras is very simple, and is called a proof by rearrangement. The two large squares shown in the figure, each contain four identical triangles, and the only difference between the two large squares is that the triangles are arranged differently. Therefore, the white space within each of the two large squares must have equal area. The triangle in figure 1 can be rearranged to create figure 2, and equating the area of the white space yields the proof attributed to Pythagoras. So, is there any evidence that a proof by rearrangement for this theorem is available in ancient Egypt? Well, since we are talking about triangles, let us look to the pyramids of Giza, the three giant triangular structures built by the ancient Africans in Egypt 2,000 years before Pythagoras was said to have been born. From above, if we rearrange the pyramids of Giza, we see evidence of the proof of the theorem. Whoa, I'm going to stop you right there, buddy. Okay, so proof of rearrangements, you rearrange the triangles to get squares, not rearrange the squares to get triangles. You just can't rearrange stuff and say, oh, this is proof by rearrangement. No, no, these are totally different things, and there is no evidence that the Egyptians did a proof by rearrangement with this, because you are rearranging the things to make a triangle. The base of Menkare's pyramid is 51.7 cubits, the base of Khafre's pyramid is 107.6 cubits, and the base of Khufu's pyramid is 115.2 cubits. Plugging into the equation, we see that the mathematical result, 119.4, is a statistically significant reasonable approximation, a difference of 4.2 cubits, only 3.5% error. This is one thing the conspiracy theorists just love to do. They love to come in after the fact, find a pattern, and say, see, they must have known about this. The Egyptians may have been saying something, I don't know, I'm not the mind reader of the Egyptians, but they said, let's make the area of the small triangle plus the area of the medium triangle equal the area of the larger triangle. And then the conspiracy theorists love to come in and say, oh, look at how the sides make a perfect right triangle. Therefore, they must have known the Pythagorean theorem. No, that's actually a large jump in logic. Um, or it could have been something else that the Egyptians were trying to do, and then it just so happens that these sides all line up perfectly. So, I mean, it is does give you pause to think, and does give you pause to investigate. However, this is not proof, because other factors may have been in uh, to actually cause that, rather than them knowing the Pythagorean. Pythagorean theorem. So overall, I think I've shown that there's no real proof that the Egyptians had the Pythagorean theorem or that Pythagoras actually learned it from the Egyptians themselves. I just find it more interesting that it may have been the Indians that he traveled to. Um,